Terry, you just were hearing, along with all of us, these new laws that were just uh, signed by the governor there. It, it comes after the controversy in Alabama, where GOP lawmakers rushed to protect IVF after the state Supreme Court there ruled frozen embryos are children. What kind of challenges politically does all of this create for Republicans? Oh, it's a huge challenge, and they know it. Um, the Republican strategists in particularly swing states recognize that these issues attacking women's reproductive health and, and women's agency over their own bodies and, and choices here uh, is political kryptonite for them. It shows all across polling that this is a huge issue. I mean, over 80 percent of the American people believe that IVF should be legal. Uh, we don't agree on 80 percent of anything in this country anymore. So it goes to show you that this, this, this spans across party lines, even within the Republican Party itself, even within the most religious extremists in the evangelical side, they agree that these that access to these types of uh, of choices should be available. And and I would say that now that we're seeing more and more of these stories um, come forth, that I don't know that a lot of Americans recognize this direct attack on women's reproductive rights or the idea of what a family is. Uh, surrogacy now, it, it was under attack in Michigan that the governor had to, to codify that right. I mean, the, this is a consistent pattern of extremism here that the Republican Party is engaging in, and particularly women voters are not going to be too keen about putting a party in power that doesn't feel as though they have equal rights or agency over their, their families and their own bodies and decisions. Yeah, I mean, Victoria, the issue, and and um, Tara was mentioning that I, maybe not a lot of people are really kind of well-versed on exactly this issue of the IVF and the controversy that these different states have, have created. How do you think this, going down the line, will play a factor in 2024, uh, in November? In one word, Jose, mobilization. Because I think that we're starting to see the broadness of what reproductive rights is. I think that for so long, it was synonymous with abortion, with access to abortion, which is a piece of it. But we're also starting to see that it has to do with the care of embryos, with the ability to have a surrogate parent, with all of these other things that are usually something that are dealt with in the privacy of one's own nuclear family. And, and this is no longer something that is in that private space of the doctor's office and the family kitchen table, but has really become politicized. And that this is really starting to perk up fears among folks who maybe were a little bit more conservative on the issue of abortion, but see these other rights as critical to family values, to the support of women and families. So I think that this is really going to be something that if the Democratic Party can effectively connect it to the electorate can be an incredibly powerful mobilization factor. And Tara, as you know, over the weekend, Donald Trump was posting all kinds of messages, including an all caps Easter message slamming his perceived potential foes. He also shared a video of an image depicting President Biden tied up in the back of a, tick, a pickup truck. We're not showing that image. But do you think this is going to have an impact on Republicans outside of Trump's base, or is this just uh, everyday thing for a lot of people. Well, unfortunately, it has become par for the course uh, for a lot of people, which has always been my fear, the normalization of Trump's malignant narcissism and violent tendencies. And you, we see millions of Americans rationalizing this, including evangelical Christians, which is uh, something rather remarkable and, and unfortunate. But will this have an impact? It should. There, if we look at the at, at the uh, polling coming out of the primary states and Republicans in closed primaries, the percentage of Republicans that voted against Donald Trump, whether it was for Nikki Haley or someone else, even when they were no longer in the race, tells you that there is a considerable chunk, up to 20 percent of the Republican Party, that does not want Donald Trump as the next president of the United States. Let's hope that their partisanship um, does not overtake their sense of of character and the need for virtue. I mean, our founding fathers questioned, you know, if there is no virtue, we are in a wretched situation. James Madison said that back way back in 1788. Virtue and character matters, not only in our leaders, but in us as the voters and the people who are the stewards of our democracy. We need to take a look at ourselves as a country and take a look at what Donald Trump is doing 
the violent imagery, the unhinged, unwell messaging and ranting that he puts on Truth Social um, versus what President Biden is doing and his vision for our country. We need to ask ourselves what type of country we want and recognize that we are responsible for the leadership that we get. Donald Trump is unwell. He's unhinged. He's a lunatic. He doesn't respect our democracy. He doesn't respect anyone. He's only about himself. And he demonstrates this every day, the future that he wants for this country. And I don't think that the American people, if they continue to pay attention, want that type of future of retribution, anger, and unhinged uh, rantings of a lunatic. My goodness. I'm just wondering, uh, Victoria, and Tara brings up such an important point about what is the essence of of the American dream? What is the essence of the United States of America? Doesn't it, does it not include virtue? And I'm just wondering the, what has become political, uh, uh, acceptable political discourse for many doesn't include virtue. It doesn't even include manners. I'm just wondering, is this the new reality for us? It's a reality for one segment of the electorate. But I do think that we have to push forward even harder with the narrative that is grounded in virtue, which is that of hope and belief for a better tomorrow. Let's remember why the United States was founded. It was for hope of freedom, hope of independence. And so I think in going back to this, this kernel of who we are as Americans, this is the tools that we need to fight back against the violent images, the violent rhetoric mm -hmm. that we're seeing come forward from President Trump. And I think it is very important that we re remind the American populace. I don't think we should make assumptions, that we should assume that everybody knows that we are a virtuous nation and that we are ultimately filled with hope. Because when you have that constant barrage of negativity, that internal innate hope can get tamped down. So we need to do just as good a job as putting forward the positive goodness that comes from social change in our country in a forward movement. What happened to lo cortés no quita lo valiente? What happened to being courteous doesn't make you any less valorous? Uh, it's an expression that I keep very close to my heart, mm -hmm. and it's just one that I fear is becoming less and less, I guess, relevant. Victoria de Francesco Soto and Tara Sedmayer, thank you both so much for being with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.